The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's webinar, Updates in Genetic Testing Related to Pediatric Cardiomyopathy. My name is Cindy Andrake, and I am the Manager of Family Support here at CCF. We're happy that you can join us for the session this evening. Some housekeeping notes before we begin. If at any point during the webinar you, or if you need technical assistance, please type your concern into the chat window and we will do our best to handle it. If you have any audio issues, you should be able to switch between your computer speakers and a phone if necessary. To provide the highest quality session today and to avoid any background noise, all attendees are currently in the listen-only mode. Your questions are encouraged and welcome during the presentation. Questions can be submitted via the question box lo located on the control, control panel on the right side of your screen. We will reserve the last 15 minutes of the presentation for your questions. Please submit your questions throughout the webinar as you think of them, and we'll go through them at the conclusion of the talk. If the control panel is preventing you from seeing the complete presentation, you can hide it by clicking the button with the small arrow to the left of the control panel. To redisplay the control panel, then click the button again. We will also be recording this webinar so that we may offer it to those who are unable to attend live, and it will be available on CCF's YouTube channel, CCF Heart Kids. So with housekeeping reminders complete, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Wendy Chong and Dr. Teresa Lee as our webinar presenters this evening. Dr. Wendy Chong is an AM, ABMG board certified clinical and molecular geneticist with 20 years of experience in human genetic research of monogenic and complex traits, including diseases such as breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, congenital heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, inherited arrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, obesity, diabetes, and autism. Dr. Chung directs NIH-funded research programs in human genetics of birth defects and leads the precision medicine research in the Irving Institute at Columbia University. She has authored over 450 peer-reviewed papers and seven, 75 reviews and chapters in medical texts. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Rare Impact Award from the National Organization of Rare Disorders and was recently elected to the National Academy of Medicine. She is renowned for her teaching and mentoring. Dr. Chung led the pilot newborn screening study of spiral muscular atrophy in New York that helped lead to nationwide adoption of this test in all newborns. Dr. Chung enjoys the challenges of genetics as a rapidly changing field of medicine and strives to facilitate the integration of genetic medicine into all areas of healthcare. She received her BA in biochemistry and economics from Cornell University, her MD from Cornell University Medical College, and her PhD from the Rockefeller, Rockefeller University in genetics. Also with us this evening is Dr. Teresa Lee, who is an assistant prof professor in pediatric cardiology at Columbia University. She is board certified in pediatrics, pediatric cardiology, with advanced training in heart failure transplantation and clinical genetics. As a physician scientist, her research is focused on identifying novel genetic causes of cardiomyopathies in children. Her current research, uh, her current research focus under CTSA Irving Institute Transform K-12 Award and National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute K-23 Award has been the identification of novel genetic causes of infantile cardiomyopathy. With the support of CCF funding, she is currently studying the downstream effects of novel cardiomyopathy gene to better understand the molecular changes that result in heart failure using induced pluripotent stem cells and mouse models of cardiomyopathy. She is also part of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute-funded Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Registry and is actively involved in its research efforts to understand the genetic causes of cardiomyopathy in the pediatric age group. Dr. Lee will present current genetic testing guidelines for cardiomyopathy, and Dr. Chung will follow up with recommendations for genetic reevaluation and retesting. So thank you both with, for being with us this evening. Uh, at this point, I am going to turn the screen over to Dr. Lee who is going to take over the presentation. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's really our pleasure to get a chance to do this. 
Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about the current genetic testing guidelines for cardiomyopathy. Um, and we're going to really focus this on the pediatric age group. Um, I know that we have a lot of parents of um, children with cardiomyopathy joining us tonight. Now, there's been many guidelines that have been issued by different uh, groups, including the American Heart Association, and those have really changed throughout the last couple of years. Um, the most recent guidelines are actually from just August of this year in 2020, and this was a statement that was issued from the American Heart Association and really goes through genetic testing recommendations for all types of inherited cardiovascular diseases, including cardiomyopathies. And really the recommendation that they've given is that they recommend genetic testing for all patients diagnosed with all recognized forms of cardiomyopathy. And that has been um, a slight change from what we had seen prior. Um, the adult literature or in the adult world, they have many different causes for their cardiomyopathies. A lot of those can be secondary to other issues. Um, a lot of patients, once they've had heart attacks and other things like that, can develop forms of cardiomyopathy. And so that sort of guided a lot of the recommendations in the past. Um, that was a very different case than what we see in the pediatric age group. And so our recommendation has really always been that any child with cardiomyopathy should really undergo genetic testing or at least be offered genetic testing. And we've seen the recent change that now our counterparts in adult medicine are also moving towards that model. Mm -hmm. So why test? So there's a couple of different reasons to test. One of the major uh, reasons is to try to get a diagnosis of disease. So in certain instances, it can be a major criterion for diagnosis. One of the main examples of that is a relatively um, lesser well-known form of cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and that's actually one of the diagnostic criteria that we use in order to make that, um, to actually label someone with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Um, in other cases, it can sometimes be helpful when you're trying to decide, um, although this is not an official recommendation, but there are other instances where you can get thickening of the heart um, that may not be abnormal. It may be a regular response that can commonly be seen, for example, in our elite athletes. Um, and we might want to differentiate that from another form of cardiomyopathy that I'm sure you guys are common with or know about, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so that's, um, you know, although we like to use other criteria to make the differentiation between an athlete's heart versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it can sometimes be helpful in that as well. For the most, the pediatric age group, we're really using it to confirm or support our clinical diagnosis. And in some instances, it can help with the subtype classification. What is also helpful is it can be helpful in terms of management. So for example, if we know what gene is actually causing the cardiomyopathy, it can help us determine if there's other things that we need to look for. So there may be rhythms, rhythm issues, certain subtypes can progress more quickly than others, um, or there can be heart block or other things like that that we may want to be mindful of and monitor more closely. Other times, the gene can actually be part of a syndrome. Um, and what that means is that in addition to the cardiomyopathy, individual child might actually have other associated findings, and those can be in other organ systems. And so knowing that that's the underlying diagnosis can help us really be more mindful in the way that we're taking care of this child. It may involve other testing to make sure that there's not other normalities in other organ systems. Rarely, but sometimes, the causative gene can actually help guide our choice of therapy. Um, that's common more so um, for our adults in certain subtypes, but it's also becoming more increasingly important as we know that a lot of people, um, especially in the research fields, are now looking for specific types of treatment. And a lot of times those specific types of treatment are based on your underlying genetic cause for your cardiomyopathy. So this is becoming more and more important. Um, a lot of times right now in the current you know, 2020 era that mostly 
qualifies you for clinical trials or other research studies. Um, but as we see this really change over the next couple of years, um, there may actually become molecularly targeted treatments. And so therefore, knowing the genetic cause can be really helpful. And then the other thing that we always want to be mindful of is we're not just taking care of the child, but we're really taking care of the whole family. And so one of the things that can be helpful is knowing the genetic cause in the child can help us identify if other siblings, if parents or other extended family members can all be at risk. So how does genetic testing work? Um, so generally, we extract DNA that can be done from a number of sources. The most common sources are going to be from a blood draw. And so that's a simple blood draw um, that can actually be done either with the doctor who's ordering the testing. A lot of times um, it can be done at a local lab if that's easier. Um, there's even some of the commercial testing companies offer at home phlebotomy services. Um, and it can also be done off of either a saliva sample or a cheek swab. And basically, we're just using those as sources to get DNA. So DNA, as you all, um, all, as you all know, is the building blocks and the instructions for um, our body and also the instructions for our heart. Um, after the DNA is, is, is extracted, it undergoes a library preparation. So basically, at the commercial testing center, um, they basically prepare the DNA, and then they do sequencing. And that allows them to essentially proofread your gene to see if there are any mistakes. So after you decide that you would like to have a genetic test done, um, there's basically three possible test results. And that's either a negative test result, a positive test result, or what's known as a variant of unknown or uncertain significance, or a VU. So I'm going to go through each of those and explain what those test results mean. I'm going to start with positive. So a positive test result basically says that the test has identified a pathogenic or disease-causing genetic variant that is specific in a cardiomyopathy gene. And this confirms that there is indeed an underlying genetic cause for the cardiomyopathy. It also, in the cases of syndromes and other types of disorders, it can provide a specific genetic disorder that has the cardiomyopathy as a known feature. We can also get a negative test result. And what a negative test result means is that there is no reportable medically relevant variants identified in the genes that we tested. And I want to be very specific in saying that it's the gene we tested. So when we test for cardiomyopathy generally, we are ordering a panel of genes. And that can vary from anything in the magnitude of 10 to the teens to upwards of 90 genes. Um, so the panels are specific and the doctor, either the geneticist or the cardiologist or the physician that's ordering the test will be the one that generally chooses which panel to test for. And what a negative test means is that the cause for cardiomyopathy remains unknown. I do want to stress that it does not mean that there's not an underlying genetic cause. It simply just means that with the test that we did and with the knowledge that we have at the time that that test was interpreted, that we are unable to identify genetic changes um, in regions that we can look at, um, or sometimes there's a lot that we still don't know, and that's why there's a lot of research being done in this area. Um, it may be in a gene that we don't yet know about, or a gene that's simply just not included on that commercial testing panel. The third possibility is having a variant of uncertain significance. Now, this is an inconclusive outcome of a genetic test. And really what it tells us is that there is a change in the gene, um, but we don't know if it's associated with disease and uh, we don't really know what it means. So it could be, for example, a benign variant or what we call a polymorphism. And those are just genetic changes that we all have that are just sort of a part of our, um, our different diversity. Um, or it could be something that could be associated with disease, but we just don't have the evidence as of yet to prove that. So um, those are your possible testing outcomes. Um, and based on what your test shows, we have the ability at times to then test other individuals within the family. 
The only time that it's really useful to test family members is when we know that one individual, and I should say that we generally like to test the person in the family who is the most affected with the disease. Um, a lot of times we may have families come in where their child may not be the one that's affected with disease, but there may be a very, very distant relative who may or may not have had um, a true diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, um, there may be a question, um, or they might have had known cardiomyopathy, um, but they're not available to be genetically tested. Um, but we do like to test the person within the family that has the, um, the strongest clinical findings. Um, if we are able to identify that there is a variant or a mutation within the family that is causing the cardiomyopathy, we can then go and test other individuals in the family. And that may be people who don't yet have clinical disease. And if you test individuals, in this case, we're not doing the panel of genes that I talked about, we're only specifically looking at the genetic variant that we know is associated with cardiomyopathy within your family. So as opposed to proofreading all of genes, we're only looking at one very specific change within one very specific gene. Now, if you were to get tested for that, a positive test result would indicate that that person who has the positive test result has an increased risk for developing cardiomyopathy. If you test negative, the flip side of that is that you are at no higher risk of developing cardiomyopathy than anyone within the general population, because it means that you don't have that variant that is shared among your family that is causing cardiomyopathy. And so that's some of the ways that we use um, testing within the pediatric cardiomyopathy world. Um, and I'm going to turn it to, over to Dr. Chung, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, other instances and other times when you may want to revisit genetic testing or um, you know, go back for a genetics evaluation. Thank you, Teresa. I'm going to share my screen now, hopefully. Okay. Great. So picking up where Dr. Lee went off, um, one of the things is I want to be transparent about the fact that we don't know everything yet. So Dr. Lee described that the genetic test could give one of uh, three general types of or five results, I'll put it that way. Um, but in general, I'll call it positive, negative, or uncertain. Those are the three main categories. We sometimes break down positive or negative slightly more, but it's those three main buckets. Um, the issue becomes uncertain. And what happens with uncertain is that we just don't have enough information at the time when we're reviewing the result to know for sure whether it's a normal variant or whether in fact it might be disease associated. I will say that these types of results are more likely to come up for individuals who are not of European ancestry. And that simply is a reflection of having less experience with doing genetic testing or looking at genetic information from individuals from those parts of the world. Um, they're just underrepresented in terms of the genetic research or the genetic testing that's been previously done. So we don't always know what it means. And we want to be careful not to overinterpret something as being disease associated when it truly is just a normal variant. So the graph that I'm showing you here is just to show you that um, this is a, a work in progress. It's still evolving. And just to say that we have tried as a community to come up with very rigorous standards to evaluate the evidence supporting how we interpret those variants. But as we've become more rigorous, and I think this has been especially true for cardiomyopathies, we have realized that we needed to reclassify some genetic variants. So for those of you who might be listening, I'm gonna try and orient you to the timing. We came up with these recommendations as a community in 2015, and they uh, started being implemented in 2015, 2016. So if any of you had genetic testing prior to that, prior to 2015, that's when things, they're sort of shifting sand to a certain extent, because at that point there was less uh, uniform in terms of the standards and the guidelines for variant interpretation. 
After that time, I think we've gotten much better. I think there's much less shifting in the sand and there's more consensus. And this is just to show you that laboratories are working together. And even though there might have been that 22% in yellow at the top where there was disagreement, laboratories work together and try and come to consensus. And so that 22% translates into only 5% disagreement. And, and again, the laboratories are working very hard to minimize that amount of disagreement. So you might be saying to yourself, well, Dr. Chung, so how does this, you know, what happens here? What happens if there's the laboratory suddenly realizes that there's a discrepancy? Um, you know, would I ever get this information back? So let me explain the process of how this works so that you know how to check back in with your provider. Um, if the laboratory sees the particular variant that was reported in your test report, if they see it again in another person, independently, probably not even a family member of yours, but someone else, they, that oftentimes for them triggers the process of reevaluating the data. And as they go back to reevaluate that data, they oftentimes look back to see if they've seen that variant before. And if that classification now in the modern era, in the last five years, should be different than it was before, and they will go back and usually issue a revised report. That revised report oftentimes goes, well, in fact, always goes back to the ordering physician. So it doesn't go back directly to the patient, but goes back to the ordering physician. And then the ordering physician hopefully gets that information back to the patient. There's not a uniform guideline yet about how often that should happen um, or exactly what the process should be. But right now, good laboratories um, are doing this for free. Um, they're not charging people to uh, patients to do this. And in general, they've taken it upon themselves to do what they think is just the right thing to do, which is that if they see this, then they call it out. I will say though that they're not necessarily proactively doing this. So they're not going back and you can imagine to go back to hundreds or thousands of reports and look at everything again. They're not doing that unless they see it themselves again or if a patient or, or their doctor calls up the laboratory and asks for a reinterpretation. So again, the times when oftentimes someone will ask about a reinterpretation is if they had a variant of uncertain significance, what Dr. Lee talked about, and they go back to their doctor and they say, hey, can you just double check, see if there's any more information known about that? The doctor can then call the laboratory and they will, as I said, oftentimes free of charge, go back and reinterpret that and take another look at it. Or sometimes what happens is another member of the family comes to clinical attention and may get, for instance, diagnosed um, and may not share the expected results. And that can also trigger um, a second look, being able to look back at that information. So as Dr. Lee said though, the testing she described is often panels of genes associated with cardiomyopathy. And that's a focused way. It's usually a very, very good test in the sense that um, it includes not just one genetic cause of cardiomyopathy, but many genetic causes. And it tends to, in a good way, be cost effective because it's focused on the 10, 20, 30 genes that might be associated with cardiomyopathy. However, I want to draw your attention to this is this we're here today because of the CCF or the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. And being uh, Dr. Lee and I are both pediatricians, the thing I want to call out is that children are not just uh, sort of little people. So it's not their genetic causes of their cardiomyopathy are not always the same as they are in adults. And most of the genetic tests that were developed were initially developed because of the genes identified in adults. And so the, the reason I mention this is because if you end up with a normal genetic test result after having testing with the panel of genes Dr. Lee describes, and the individual being tested is a child or was a child, at least at the time they started developing the cardiomyopathy, that test may not be complete. It's not complete for adults either, so it's not that kids are the only ones, but in children especially, it may be incomplete. And the younger the child at the time of the diagnosis of the cardiomyopathy, the more incomplete the test is if it's a panel of genes. And I'll get to, in a second, the alternatives. Um, so if you end up having a normal result, and I would say this is especially true if there's more than one person in the family with the condition, then Dr. Lee and I would say, well, it's clear that there's probably an underlying genetic cause 
we just haven't done the right test. We haven't, or we haven't looked at the information the right way. And so we've missed that. So in the field of genomics, we've developed something called exome and genome sequencing. This is a way of really looking at all the genetic information. Um, and uh, exome is kind of a shortcut in the sense that we look at about 1.6% of the genetic information, but it's the 1.6% that matters. Um, and we try and focus on that. We also have, as I said, genome sequencing, where we sequence all 3 billion base pairs. And this is just showing you the diagnostic yield on the y-axis or the likelihood of getting an answer by indication. And I want to draw your attention specifically to cardiovascular. In this case, this is not just cardiomyopathy. It also includes some other heart conditions. But the point is that you will often find the answer um, when doing this more comprehensive test when the focused or the targeted test did not give the answer. Furthermore, even when we look at everything by looking at an exome or a genome, we also appreciate that we still don't know everything. Um, and so this is simply a graph showing you that over a period of time, and to me, this is a period of three years, which is not too much time, um, even the 75% of cases when we did exome sequencing and didn't have an answer, just three years later, when we went back and looked at that same information again, we were able to come up with an answer or a possible answer about half of the time. So again, my take home message is, is that if your doctor thinks that there's a likelihood that this may be genetic, maybe because of your family history, maybe because of some particular early age of onset or unusual features, um, maybe cardiomyopathy plus something else, all of those are indications for me that you should keep looking and either get a second opinion or go back and look at it again uh, after a period of time, usually at least one year later. So within this, though, we don't know everything. And I know I've said that this is the third time I'm saying that, but it really is true. We're learning a lot. We're learning awfully fast, but we don't know everything. I'm not going to go through all of the details to explain what we're missing, but it's clear that we're still missing some things um, and we're developing new technologies to get at the dark matter, get at the things that we might be missing. So we can talk more about that um, for people in the Q&A if they have questions, but just to say we keep continuing to develop and improve the testing that we have. So I wanted to switch gears for just a second, and I am so privileged to be able to speak to the CCF community, and you've been part of some really important research. And so I wanted to use this opportunity to give back to you the results of the study that you enabled um, as participants to understand the impact of genetic testing, specifically on families and, and parents being the reporter for families, but also on adolescents themselves, adolescents who had been involved in genetic testing. So as we did this, uh, we had the real opportunity that I'm uh, very grateful for to partner with sites that were in the pediatric cardiomyopathy registry, as well as families that were invited by the CCF to participate in this survey study. We surveyed parents uh, who had children who were genetically tested for cardiomyopathy before the age of 18. And then again, if individuals were between the ages of 13 and 18 when they had the genetic testing, we invited the parents to invite their adolescents. And so all told, we had about 200, a little over 200 people who participated, uh, 162 parents and 48 adolescents. And I'm going to divide these up in the discussion for individuals who had cardiomyopathy. So they were getting essentially a test to understand what the genetic reason was for the cardiomyopathy. But as Dr. Lee was talking about, we also had some people who were asymptomatic, who didn't have cardiomyopathy at the time of testing, but they had genetic testing because there was a gene or a person in their family with cardiomyopathy, then they wanted to understand if they were at risk. And it's important to uh, differentiate these two groups because again, some individuals with cardiomyopathy might think about genetic testing differently than individuals who are basically healthy, but getting information about future risk. So as we did that, Again, these are just some demographics. Uh, into parents were sort of typical parents of uh, children who have cardiomyopathy. Um, little plug, moms were a little bit better than answering than dads, but I wanna uh, call out the dads. We had a really nice, robust response rate from them. And then from the adolescents themselves, we had about 50-50 males and females. So what did we find out? 
Um, well, we found out that uh, with this, number one, we had really good families, good families in the sense that they were good about communicating information within their families to their children uh, with cardiomyopathy as well as to their other family members. Um, they really thought of this as a family affair and tried to help each other out with that. Um, on the other hand, we understood, and I know many of you understand, that the emotions went with this were, I think, very understandable. Parents of children who had cardiomyopathy were understandably, I think, very um, um, sort of affected just because their child had the cardiomyopathy. The genetic testing, I think they found helpful on top of that, but I think a lot of their emotions were because of the cardiomyopathy, as opposed to that second group I told you about, for parents who had children without cardiomyopathy, a lot of the emotion they felt was in response to whether that result was positive or negative. And of course, you know, had a little more concern if their test was positive and there was a future risk than if their child was, if you will, off the hook um, and might not have had that future risk. So with this, one of the things that I was also very impressed by um, is that the family dynamics were really good, uh, good in the sense that there wasn't a blame game going on, that family functioning still seemed to be good, um, and that and we measured this with the specific outcome measures that individuals were still you know, getting along and still actually, if anything, brought closer together after the genetic testing. Um, in addition, for the adolescents themselves, uh, the adolescents were very much involved in the process. Uh, they wanted to be involved, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and in general, they were happy to know about the results, even if they were positive. So positive or negative, they were glad to have the information. They felt empowered, um, and it didn't adversely affect their relationship, either with their parents or their other family members. One of the things that we were interested in is um, understanding um, when and how adolescents should be involved in the decision-making process about testing. And as we learned about this, both being involved before the testing and after the testing, um, there was a little bit of discrepancy between adolescents and their parents. And, and that's what I want to bring to your attention in case you happen to have an adolescent or a child who will eventually be an adolescent. And that's that I think overall the impression I had from both the surveys as well as talking to parents are that parents I think were understandably trying to be protective of their adolescent and oftentimes finding out the information first so they could think about how to present that to the adolescent, how to frame it, um, how to contextualize it, how to support their adolescent or their youngster. Um, whereas adolescents veered a little bit towards wanting to be directly involved, wanting to hear, for instance, results at the same time their parents were hearing results, wanting to be very um, much an equal member, an equal part of this, um, with the idea it's their information, it's, it's their lives, and they really are becoming increasingly independent. And I, I think that's great that they want to take some ownership. Um, we asked them, is there a specific age that we should think about, you know, involving young people in this? And we got back the response, both from adolescents and parents is, it depends. Um, it depends on how mature the individual is, and that doesn't necessarily equal chronological age. I can say that's true of my own kids. Um, and so really think about it, individualizing that based on the level of maturity. But overall, just to sum up, uh, I think what I've been saying and also what Dr. Lee has been saying, and I'll emphasize that we really are entering an era where the genetic testing is more powerful. It's not perfect, but it's more powerful. And I think it's going to be increasingly important. Um, increasingly important, as Dr. Lee said, in part for prognosis, in part to be able to identify other family members at risk, and really, really important because our treatment is going to start to be tailored based on the underlying gene and maybe even the underlying mutation. We're just starting to see some of that coming online. And in certain cases in children for conditions like Pompe disease, we even have very specific enzyme replacement treatment uh, for certain types of cardiomyopathy. Again, that's the exception, not the rule, uh, but it does speak to the fact that tailoring treatment is going to become increasingly important. Um, as I've said, though, this is shifting. Um, we don't know everything. We're, we're trying to be honest and open about that, but we are trying to uh, expand the testing specifically for children because we do realize the deficiency we, deficiencies we have with some of the standard testing. Um, I'll preempt a question I often get, which is that this type of testing is usually covered by insurance. Um, you may need to go to a special doctor, a geneticist with a genetic counselor. If your regular cardiologist is having the trouble getting the 
cardiologist covered or to a CCF center of excellence. Oftentimes those cardiologists are more experienced and have people on their team who know how to be able to get the insurance coverage for the testing. And as we've talked about, I think it's important when appropriate based on the maturity level of a child uh, to involve them in the process. And as parents, obviously, you know your kids really well and you know, um, you know how to be able to support them through this process. So with that, I will uh, end this part of, oh, I was supposed to actually keep a slide on, now I remember, sorry. <laughs> and I just realized I didn't have my camera on. I apologize about that. You have this random person talking at you. Let me see <laughs> if I can share my screen again. Okay. Great, perfect. Yep, yeah, that's okay. Okay, um, okay. so um, thank you both, uh, Dr. Lee and, and Dr. Chung. We really appreciate um, taking time from your day to um, spend it with us and to go through this information. It was excellent and um, really appreciate that you gave us some updates on your research study, uh, Dr. Chung, that was great. Um, I, I have two questions that were given to me before the presentation, so I think you've probably mentioned some of these. Um, and I just want to encourage anybody that's on, if you'd like to ask any questions, you can just put it into the question box and I'll read it out to um, both Dr. Chung and Dr. Lee. So uh, one question, I think you've talked about this quite a bit, is um, would the results of genetic testing alter a patient's treatment plan? Um, Dr. Lee, you, think, you have to oh, Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can, um, I can sort of speak to that and then Dr. Chung can definitely jump in. Um, I think, you know, as um, a cardiologist, I would say, you know, Dr. Chung mentioned some of the specifics. So, for example, Pompeys, there is enzyme treatment that can actually completely reverse some of the cardiac features that we see. So there are specific cases um, they're relatively on the, um, they're not the majority, they're definitely the minority of cases, um, but there are some times where it can be extremely helpful. Um, in certain instances, um, carnitine deficiency, you can really you know, make the cardiomyopathy go away. So, you know, there are, you know, I think some cause, um, some cases where it's very, and it's very, uh, you know, it clearly gives you a different management strategy. Um, and in other cases, it may not be as, you know, black and white or as, you know, that definitive. Um, but it's always, I think it's always helpful um, for those of us that are on the clinical side managing these patients. It helps to give us just, it's every piece of information gives us a better um, idea of how to understand. Um, it, I think what it really helps for us is, um, helping to sort of prognosticate and having an idea of what we think um, might, what are some of the likely things that we can sort of anticipate. Um, and then the most important thing that, you know, we've sort of talked about is it also allows us to identify, again, other siblings, other, you know, parents, other family members who also might be at risk. So it's sort of, it's management and sort of those um, instances that are also very, very helpful. So it's not just necessarily medication management. Um, but you know, I think that that's going to definitely change as we do more and as there's more research and as there's targeted treatments. Yep. I'd agree with what Dr. Lee said. And I'll just um, tell you one thing one of my patients said to me once is that um, it's like looking at your balance in your bank account. You can either decide that you don't want to look at your balance, but your balance is still there. But if you know what your balance is, you might have a better sense of either if you've saved enough money to you know, buy something or if you need to be saving more. Um, so that's what Dr. Lee, I think, was saying in part is that knowledge is power. Um, we as physicians, I think, tend to err on the side of knowledge being helpful to us because the more certain we can be about whether it's prognosis or treatment options or how to manage family members, um, we'd like to be able to not waste time or resources and to focus and make sure that we don't miss anything. Dr. Lee, especially, she's a perfectionist, so she doesn't, she never misses anything. Um, so I think from our point of view, we'd like that. And on the other hand, we're not the only ones that matter. Um, clearly, the families are the ones that matter. But I think once they appreciate that you know, the genes are there, the genetics are there, regardless of whether or not we open that envelope and see what the result is, um, the more that we can have this information, the more useful it is. 
Um, I'll also say that, and I know that, um, you know, some people may or may not appreciate this. I want to give a shout out. Um, the Seidman's Cricket and John Seidman have been pioneers in the field specifically of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and they've literally worked a lifetime, um, really blood, sweat, and tears and brilliant work. And a lot of the work that they've spent a lifetime developing is, I would predict, coming to fruition in terms of treatment. Um, and it's specifically around some genetic forms of cardiomyopathy. And to be able to benefit from some of those treatments that are not quite ready yet. So don't jump online and, you know, sort of look at where you can uh, get the prescription. But I do predict that sometime within the next five to 10 years, for many people, these treatments are going to be um, available. And I don't know, it may even be that people start using these pre-symptomatically or at least in very, very early ages of disease. And so it's going to be important to know what you should be watching, what you should be paying attention to, and if you're the type of person that these might be beneficial for, because you will need to know your genetic subtype, if it is genetic, and then what genetic subtype of cardiomyopathy it is. So stay tuned. Um, you know, similar things for Noonan syndrome may be coming around the bend at some point. Um, as Dr. Lee said, a few that are already available. So, um, you know, we need to we need to be prepared, I think, is the, the point, so that we can make sure that you benefit from all the advances in medicine. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so here's another question. It is remarkable how the diagnostic yield can change a little over a year, in, in a, a little over a year or two. What is known about true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative rates for exome sequencing for pediatric cardiomyopathy? Is it date? different based on type? What is it for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So maybe I'll take a stab at this and Dr. Lee will chime in if she thinks anything different. Um, so I would say mostly we're limited by the rarity of this condition. So in other words, the needle is not changing nearly as rapidly as I wish it would. Um, and that's largely because we learn faster when we have more people to learn from. So the more people that we have, um, the faster we learn. And that's because we're not convinced if we see something just once that it's the answer. But when we start seeing the same thing twice or three times or 10 times or 100 times, then we see the pattern. And statistically, we, we have these ways of analyzing it and appreciating that it isn't just by chance alone that we're seeing it, but that it's, it's the real deal. Um, you couldn't just by chance that over and over again. Um, I'll just give a lot of credit to Dr. Lee because she's had one of her research problems, which has been one of the toughest but most important research problems, I think, for this community, which is infants with cardiomyopathy. And in a good way, that condition is especially rare, but it's so, so, so important for the families who are affected. But because it's so rare, um, oftentimes we might see something, Dr. Lee might see something only once, and it's hard to know for sure whether that's the answer because we've only seen it once and it could just be by chance alone. Um, we are developing better computational tools, and I won't go into all of the details, but other ways of being able to improve our signal to noise ratio. So you were asking about false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives, things like that, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but I, we are developing tools so that it's not going to take um, huge, huge numbers of people, but I do think at some point we're going to get more than a couple hundred or even Five numbers right now for children with cardiomyopathy is looking at 500 individuals with exome sequencing. We really ideally need more like 5,000. Um, you know, once we started getting up to those numbers, I think we'd start to be able to see the signals. Um, when it comes to exome sequencing in particular, we generally don't have false positives. So we generally have, we're really certain when we give something back to families from that. So I'm not really worried about false positives per se. I am worried about quote unquote false negatives in the sense that we haven't found the genetic answer and there really is something there. And if we only knew how to look at it the right way, then maybe we'd be able to see it. Um, but just so that you understand what the challenge is, when we're looking at such vast amounts of information, we might have 50,000 different genetic variants, and we're trying to tell what is the one genetic variant causing the cardiomyopathy out of that 50,000. And so that's what I mean in terms of signal to noise. Signal being one, 
noise being 50,000? And how do you figure out which one of those 50,000 is the right answer for the family? And that's, that's how it gets really tough. So I don't think we pick the wrong one out of the 50,000 because we're quite conservative and we're quite certain when we see that. But I do think that sometimes we get the list down to 50, and, and that's good to go from 50,000 to 50, but still amongst 50, we don't sort of spam cardiologists and parents and geneticists with 50 because that's too many. That's too much uncertainty. That's not useful in terms of how to use that information. So in general, I, I guess the way to think about it is that we're uh, very conservative. But again, if we really motivated, and largely it's U.S. families that motivate us, we can go back again and again and without any additional cost, no more blood samples, no more saliva samples, just going back to the old information and then edit it again with fresh eyes. Dr. Lee, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would actually um, sort of just, I mean, everything that you said um, really was um, perfect in terms of explaining that. Um, I think there's also just an understanding, and I was so happy to hear that you went over some of the research studies, um, because a lot of what we're dealing with, we're really bridging the realm of what is known and also trying to move, um, trying to have forward progress within this field. Um, and so there's a lot that we do, especially in one of the CCF centers or a big major uh, medical center that is really on the cutting edge. Um, Dr. Chang is definitely like one of the pioneers and just one of the superstars in this field of um, looking at exome data from various diseases, but it really does kind of require that expertise um, that you know, forward thinking, that knowledge of precision medicine, but it's not, you know, we don't just kind of look at what we know, we're constantly trying to move it forward. Um, and that's really, I think, just, again, a shout out to all our families, um, because the to ha we couldn't do this unless you were partnering with us. Um, we're only able to do this because you're willing to enroll in research studies, and you're willing to allow us to, you know, look at your genetic information and your family's genetic information. And so that is so powerful. Um, you know, we are so appreciative of that. And I think, um, you know, we both want to, you know, Tom and I both really just want to thank you, um, you know, as a foundation for that. Um, CCF has been so important in that. But, you know, we're, you know, we're really dedicated and I think passionate about this field and moving it forward. But we do, you know, we're definitely on that realm of, you know, something we might, we might see today um, might not make sense, but, you know, like literally, you know, a couple of years later, it may make sense. Thank you. Uh, you know, I can speak on behalf of CCF that we are um, very appreciative of both of you um, and how you are moving uh, the needle forward in terms of um, genetics with cardiomyopathy. Um, one last question I have. Um, are there any negatives to genetic testing? Will it impact uh, whether or not someone will be able to get insurance uh, in the future? Maybe I'll take a first stab at this, and I'm sure Dr. Lee has something to add too. So um, there's something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So in the United States, that's a federal law that protects anyone um, from being discriminated in terms of losing their health insurance or having their rates raised based on genetic information. Now, this law was put in place not so much for people who already have a diagnosis of a gene disease, so in other words, someone who already has cardiomyopathy. This law was put in place for those asymptomatic individuals, people who don't yet have cardiomyopathy in their hearts, but their genes predispose them to develop that in the future. So the idea is, is that if you did that genetic test because you knew there was a cardiomyopathy gene in your family, and if you found out that you shared that genetic factor, that doesn't mean you have a pre-existing condition, at least not right now, and hopefully nothing changes within this. So you can't, like I said, have your rates raised, you can't be denied health insurance, you can't have your job taken away, you can't be denied a promotion based on that genetic information. Um, that doesn't cover everything in the sense that it doesn't cover life insurance, long-term care or disability insurance. So you still, in theory, someone could say, well, if you wanna take out a million dollar life insurance policy, someone could ask you, have you ever had genetic testing? And you'd need to answer that honestly. And if you did, you know, they could ask you what the result was. 
Um, so those are the vulnerabilities. Uh, what do people do if they're asymptomatic but want to know about their genetic disease risk? Um, I've had some patients that will take out insurance policies first, and then they're honest and you know open in terms of their insurance policy, and then get tested, and then decide if they want to continue on policies. Um, so there are ways of being able to deal with that type of risk. Um, I would also personally, and I, I can say I've been advocating to insurance companies for this, that really I think the issue is, is that everyone has risk. You may not know your risk. Remember, you've got a bank account balance. You haven't maybe looked at your bank account balance if you decided not to, but everyone has risk. I think it's really what you do with your risk. And if you can mitigate some of that risk or protect yourself against some of that risk, you're actually better off and they're better off. So we'll see. At some point, maybe I'll make some traction with them. Um, but, but that is the way things work. Um, I will say because CCF is international and there may be families from Canada or the UK or other parts of the world looking in, I don't. There are different laws in different countries. Definitely talk with your local genetics or cardiac teams in your local countries to see what the guidance is locally. Um, but in general, we tend to be a little bit behind the times, if anything, in the U.S. So hopefully where you are is even better than what I just outlined. I think that answered it perfectly, unless, you know, we need to give, but that was exactly what I would have said. Okay, thank you. Um, I have some more. Uh, is it possible to submit inconclusive genetic data that we have on a deceased family member so that it can be looked at maybe years from now when new information is found? Yeah, so if the data are still good, I mean, they're electronic, right, in terms of, so people can look at that as many times as they'd like. Um, it, it brings up, not that this was the question, but I'll also say, unfortunately, I know many families have lost children to cardiomyopathy. Um, I'll also say that if anyone had the foresight to retain a DNA sample, a blood sample, even a blood spot, usually doesn't work with a lock of hair. I will say we've tried things like that, that doesn't work so well. But other things that have DNA, it is possible sometimes to go back to that sample, and use the word genetic technologies, if that technology wasn't available when your child either had testing or passed away. And we can talk off there, give some answers to CCF about where you can post, um, you know, where which labs to work with or what can be used if that's in, you know, if any use to any of the families. But yes, the answer, the simple answer is yes, we can go back and look at old information again as many times as we want. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is two questions that I'll combine is one, um, it's from the same person. Are exome sequence results being solicited for a computational modeling? I have one to offer, how can I submit this data? And uh, please may Dr. Chung repeat the names of those closely looking at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for okay. decades. Okay, so um, and that's great. Um, donate your data. <laughs> we can put up uh, Dr. Lee or, di or my email address and we certainly would love to add you um, to the rest of the choir so that we can work together to figure this out. Um, we can either you can Google us or we'll give you the email addresses for us to post later. So that's the first. Um, I'll also say the second one, I have no financial interest in this company, so it's, this is absolutely for my disclosure, I have no conflicts here. The company is called Myocarda, um, it was recently acquired actually, and the two scientists who have dedicated their lives are the Seidmans, S-E-I-D-M-A-N, and it's Christine and Jonathan Seidman. And there are many other great people in the field as well, but I do want to give credit to them. They really have made a tremendous input into the field. Great. I believe, uh, is it myo, um, can you remind us, is it myocardio with a K? Myocardio with a K, thank you. So when you look it up, it's myocardio with a K. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's it for questions. Um, I will share, um, uh, information, your emails, if that's okay, um, with people that are on this uh, webinar. Um, I did have somebody that said thank you both very much. <laughs> um, I, uh, on behalf of CCF, um, we really appreciate taking your time. It's really an honor to have you present this information to our audience, and uh, we are so grateful that you were able to be with us tonight. So thank you, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.